Today's episode is sponsored by JetStore. JetStore meets your evolving needs for data storage, protection, and management. JetStore also leverages leading technologies to offer high-value solutions for NAS, SANS, clouds, and hyper-converged infrastructures. Visit JetStore at JetStore.com. That's J-E-T-S-T-O-R.com to get started today. We are back with another episode of Data Protection Gumbo. And of course, I am your host, Demetrius Malbro. And today we are going to cover how organizations are connecting to the world and also what type of protection do you require when you are connecting? Because obviously the more connecting that you do, the more protection that you will need. So I would like to introduce you to Jeremy Snyder, who is the founder and CEO of Firetail. Jeremy, welcome to the gumbo. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Demetrius. First and foremost, what is Firetail? Why don't you give our gumbo listeners um, a brief update around Firetail? So we do API security software. And really what that means is we help organizations understand all of those connection points that they're making with APIs today. And we provide software that brings them visibility onto all of those touch points and the connections that they have, whether those are internal APIs or third-party facing APIs. They could be the back end of their mobile app. They could be the back end of an IoT service that they're running or some kind of connected device service that they're running. Or more commonly right now, they're connecting out to third-party services that perform a particular function that they're not doing in-house. That could be something like payment processing, geolocation, or increasingly, of course, connecting to AI services. And along with kind of helping them understand all of those touch points, we help them to kind of calculate and understand the risk of all of those connections, and then give them recommendations for how to mitigate that risk and kind of get more control over the scenario for bringing that risk down. And you mentioned API protection or security, right? So right. when you when you hear about a ransomware attack or a cyber breach, because we're almost hearing about them on a daily basis, right? I just read large, the world's largest furniture company, I think they, Bassett, I think they yeah. just announced one from June and AT&T just had another large breach. It's just yep. crazy out there, right? So they never really talk about APIs, right? And how they got in or yeah, they, they always use the same language, right? Yeah, they we had a, a breach and we're trying to determine whether it's material or not. We're working with our external partners or cybersecurity experts yeah, yeah. to figure out what happened, yada, 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 right? So yeah, with, with, that in mind, with, with that in mind, what how important is it to make sure that you you have those APIs locked down or that you have the protection built in in order to kind of keep that secure? Yeah, I want to give you two parts of the answer here. Sure. First, I just want to set the context on APIs for people who don't think about them as a touch point. So first of all, more than 80% of all internet requests are API calls. And I know that number sounds kind of bonkers at first. You're like, wait, I'm not making API calls, but you are not, but all the services that you connect to are making them on your behalf. And I'll give you an example that kind of illustrates the point. So where you live, probably you have access to like DoorDash or Uber Eats. And you know that might be a different brand or a different service wherever you live in the world, people, members of the audience, but you've got some kind of food delivery service. And when you place an order, what to you is one transaction? I sat with an engineer from one of these companies and we started mapping out the data flows. Mm -hmm. And what we realized very quickly was that for one order, we got to more than 30 API calls very, very quickly. And just to kind of remind folks about how those services work, like DoorDash doesn't make your food. Uber Eats doesn't make your food. By the way, DoorDash doesn't process your payment. You know, Uber Eats isn't taking your credit card. You may load it into Uber Eats, but Uber Eats is sending your credit card data to a third-party provider, someone like Stripe or Square or JP Morgan Chase Payments or whoever it is to do that. And similarly, it's not actually Uber Eats or DoorDash delivering your food. It's some third-party driver who is getting your home address or your hotel address and your cell phone data and all of this information, your PII, personally identifiable information over APIs. So like all of that transaction happens over APIs. 
So I just wanted to kind of set the context for why APIs are so important. They really are kind of the connective tissue of the modern internet. You'll hear people call them the connective tissue, the plumbing, the duct tape, whatever metaphor you want to use. So that's mm. the first thing I want to, you know, just okay. kind of emphasize. They're they're everywhere. Second thing, last year, the number one kind of, let's call it like ransomware event, but it wasn't a single event. It was more than 2000 organizations breach was through a piece of software called move it. And it's a file mm. transfer software. If you're old school, like me, you may have heard the word FTP file transfer protocol. You know, that is a, a mechanism that's been around for a long time. It's kind of evolved over the years. And the most, some of the most modern forms of it use slightly different protocols for actually transferring the files. But regardless, there's a piece of software for secure file transfer, and it's used by a lot of financial services organizations, a lot of healthcare companies, et cetera. It's made by a company called Progress Software. And, you know, I hate calling them out because they've probably taken more than their share of grief for this incident. But there was a vulnerability in an API that ships with their software. So if you're a, you're, you know, you're an enterprise customer, you're a bank, you're a healthcare provider, what have you, you might be running this for things like, you know, people to upload loan document, loan application documents or health records or what have you, you know, mm -hmm. secure communications and secure file transfer. That API vulnerability allowed for, first of all, the abuse and the takeover of admin privileges on the API, and then for upload of a ransomware payload via a file upload API method, right? So what makes that really kind of risky for an organization or for anybody running APIs? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, most organizations didn't realize that this software actually shipped with a set of APIs that it was exposing. Yeah. Second of all, they're not monitoring those APIs, so they don't know what's kind of coming in through them. And so they can't really defend or protect them. But it kicked off, you know, ransomware incidents at more than 2000 organizations around the world to pretty devastating effects. Lots of organizations had to report material breaches on the back of this. So it's one of the reasons why we think APIs are actually a, a very fast emerging attack surface that organizations need to be paying more attention to. And APIs also very often have direct access to data, which is really the key thing to, to bear in mind. Okay. So it seems like there's some pretty large risks when it comes to APIs and you said that it's the connective tissue. So that's basically how companies are connecting to the internet all around the world. And I know maybe a click, when you click on someone's website, an API call is going in the background to right. do something, right? Put, get, put, yep. whatever, yep. those types of uh, commands that are, are, are fetching data, pulling data and showing you exactly um, what you need to see. So it is really important to make sure that your cybersecurity teams and especially the CISO and everyone understands exactly how that works and how to keep that protected. And and I, I know there's also something called secrets, right? So yeah. there's some secrets. I guess that's where you store your passwords and you have to keep that yep. stored off somewhere and keep that protected, keep that vaulted, keep it maybe encrypted or something yeah. um, as well. So there's so many aspects of it, right? So what what are... I guess some of the ways that organizations can protect their APIs against some of these threats that are out there. Yeah, I'll go through a couple of different methods and I'll start with, you know, what I think is probably the most common one that a lot of organizations are going to reach for first. They're going to say, you know what, APIs are sitting on a network and so they kind of expose a connection point. Usually there'll they'll be like HTTP or HTTPS, hopefully. And there will be a number of things that kind of follow that HTTPS colon slash slash, right? You know, api.yourorganization.com followed by a bunch of different kind of functional endpoints, they're called. And a lot of organizations will look at that and they'll be like, oh, okay, you know, that sits on a network like a lot of my other assets, my website, you know, the interface for my mail server, what have you. I'm going to throw a firewall in front of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you know, go by IP address range and I'm going to restrict access to my API for you know bad actors known bad actors and that is effective to some extent i will say in the era of cloud and in the era of things like vpns and tor and and so on it's very hard to keep high fidelity blockage of any set of bad actors i, I like to tell people you know hackers have credit cards too they might be stolen but those credit cards give them access to vpn services give them access to cloud services Hackers can change their IP address tens of times a second, right? right? So firewalls have some level of effectiveness, but they're maybe not the best protection to think about. 
one of the other things that I think people think about is they're like, well, okay, that's the traditional network firewall. We've got these things called web application firewalls. And I'll tell you, in the last couple of weeks, we've been doing multiple demos with companies who are looking at API problems where they're actually getting attacked on their APIs. All of them have web application firewalls in place. They're not preventing the attacks for pretty much the same exact reasons that I just mentioned around network firewalls. So moving on to kind of more effective mechanisms, I think you have to start with understanding like how APIs actually get breached. We've done the research on this. So if you look on the Firetail website, which is just firetail.io, go down to the bottom, you'll see a link for the API data breach tracker. Mm -hmm. We've actually cataloged all of the publicly disclosed breaches to try to help under organizations understand what are the actual underlying issues. And time and again, we see them coming back to really three things. They are authentication, authorization, and excessive data exposure. And I'll go through those just really briefly because yeah, I know they're yeah. sort of self-explanatory just by their titles, but authentication is really like, are you who you say you are and can you prove that, right? So are you Jeremy? And you mentioned earlier, you know, secrets or tokens. There's some best practices around kind of establishing identity, but the real point is that very often what we see is that developers build APIs and they try to make them really easy to consume and one yeah. of the ways they'll do that is by kind of taking some shortcuts around authentication. Mm -hmm. They're like, look, it's just an API sitting out there. Nobody knows about it. I'm just going to skip the authentication step or I'm going to make it super easy. Maybe it's like a hard coded password or secret that can be discovered in like by looking at the logs on your home router or by decompiling an Android mobile app or things like that. We've seen that happen in several cases. Mm -hmm. The other thing to look at is you know, are you actually putting the authentication in the right place? It really should be in the header of your API call. That's maybe getting a little bit more technical than we need to, but bear yeah. in mind, you, you have to authenticate. The second one is authorization. And this is where things get a lot more tricky. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are like, well, they're the same thing, right? Like if I know you're Jeremy and I know you have system access, you can do what you need to do. That's not necessarily true, right? There's me, there's you. And if I just think about a service like LinkedIn, and by the way, LinkedIn has many, many APIs and including just the basic API for using the LinkedIn mobile application. Well, there's Jeremy and there's Demetrius. And let's say, you know, Jeremy is able to view Jeremy's profile. Jeremy is able to view Demetrius's profile. Jeremy is able to edit Jeremy's profile. Jeremy should not be able to edit Demetrius's profile, right? right? So it's not only about, you know, establishing what data you have access to, but what you can do with that data. And that kind of permissions check actually needs to be taken into account relative to the data that you're requesting. This, by the way, this combination of kind of like weak authentication and bad authorization is probably the number one combination responsible for like 60, 70% of the API data breaches. The last one is that normally APIs should kind of follow a you hear a lot about least privilege as a cybersecurity concept. Yeah, and what it right. really means is that you should only have access to the things you have access to. Similarly, API should only return the data that they really need to return. So let's say in the case of me viewing your profile, I should really just see, you know, Demetrius Malbro, and then, you know, your professional credentials, your job history, educational history, whatever you've chosen to put on your profile. Yeah, right. What, what I shouldn't see in there is like your home address and your phone number and anything else that you've actually put into LinkedIn in your account details, right. but is not actually meant to be part of your public profile. But again, developers take shortcuts when they're building APIs and they're like, well, we'll just give back all the data and you just don't have to use it. Just ignore mm -hmm. it. It's there in the returned response, but just don't use it. But that we see that as, as really kind of the number three cause for excessive data okay. breach on, on APIs. Yeah. And so... I assume, and I've heard that developers take shortcuts because they want to go fast, right? It's all about moving as fast as possible, but the security angle may or may not be taken into consideration. That's why yeah. there's so many bugs and so many vulnerabilities because they just want to iterate and get that thing out, get it automated, get it, boom, get it out into production. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think blaming developers for that is, mm. is necessarily the right way to think about it because a lot of the times they're under organizational pressure to do that. You know, how many developers yeah. do you talk to and you're like, hey, do you have all the time on this project that you Take need to do time. a security Take review? <laughs> yeah, like, you never hear that, right? It, it's a hyper-competitive landscape. Yeah. And so, you know, the pressure to ship and deliver is on. And 
you know, security often just gets kind of left out of the equation because of deadlines, not because of malicious intent or neglect or, you know, just like, oh, that's not my job. I don't care about security. I've never met a developer who was like, yeah, I really don't care. I don't care if my application ex accidentally exposes too much data. No, mm -hmm. it's it's pressure, it's deadlines, it's, you know, sometimes it's organizational kind of mindset around like the relative importance of security. Yeah. But I don't I don't ever think it's malicious intent. Okay, yeah. So m maybe let's talk about some best practices for API security compliance. Do, do you have any that are maybe hard hitting that CIOs or even CISOs or maybe even the practitioner out there need yeah. to be aware of? Yeah, look, when it comes to security teams, the number one thing I always tell them is first be aware of all of your APIs. Um, very often it's the case that, you know, just like we just talked about, developers are told to move fast. So they move fast, they get their jobs done, they're given a set of requirements. They might build more APIs to fulfill those requirements than anybody knows about. And very often they get shipped to production without a security team even knowing that there is an API sitting on a server somewhere, you know, serving up requests and traffic and so on. So number one rule, just be aware of all of them. Maintain visibility. If you don't know it's there, you have no hope of securing it, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's an easy kind of global truth to, to share, right? Yeah. Maybe easier to easier said than done, but it's you know the starting point, in my opinion. Number two is when you think about kind of understanding or or inspecting those APIs once you've found them, going back to what we realize around why the data gets breached. All of those are factors in the design of the API. So assessing the design of the API is really the next best step into calculating and understanding the risk. That can be done programmatically. APIs are code. You can inspect code. APIs very often have something called a specification file that describes their functionality in mm -hmm. you know, very easily machine readable detail. Actually, one other really strong best practice is to make sure that your developers are always shipping a specification file that makes mm -hmm. it super easy to catalog the API and to assess the risk again. So that's the second thing is that assess the risk. If you've got spec files, so much the better. Uh, if you don't have them, there are methods for kind of calculating them based on observed traffic. But if you don't know that the API is there, you can't really observe the traffic. So a little bit of a circular problem. But those are like the number one and number two. The number three thing that I always tell people is like, one challenge around APIs, especially in the age of cloud, is that they can kind of run anywhere. So if you look at like cloud platforms today, you've got you know virtual machines, you've got serverless functions, you'll hear about containers and Kubernetes and you know all of these new and fancy and, and simple ways to run application code. One challenge for a security practitioner is that all of them generate logs of different types and in different locations. And if you're the security team and you're trying to understand what's going on with your organization and your organization's APIs, you might be scrambling to go get logs from here and there and everywhere. Mm. So I always tell people one really recommended best practice. I, I rarely see this done, by the way, centralize your logs to the extent okay. that you can get all of your API logs in one location. You can really understand what data is coming in, what data is going out. And you know who is requesting that data? Is it only the people that we think should be requesting that data, and so on? So those are kind of my top three: okay. visibility, yeah. assessment, centralized logging. Now the logging from the APIs yeah. is, is that something that the SOC or the Security Operations Center need to be like that should be on the dashboard, right? Is is that is that something that they should be aware of? They should, and very often they're not. Okay. Um, for all the reasons that I just mentioned, it, it's too many different log it's types too in too many places, et cetera. And millions yeah. of lines of code and of, of information coming in. And, and I know that there are tools out there to yeah. help filter out some of the noise with artificial intelligence yeah. and only bring forward the ones that are not false positives, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, okay. not to plug us, but we're, we're a company that does that. There are others to be sure. There are also open source projects to look at and Exactly to your point, no SOC team wants to get every single line <laughs> of API log code because yeah. it is millions. I mean, we talked to recently we talked to a small company who who remain nameless. They're, you know, they're probably a $20 million a year revenue business, which is, you know, don't get me wrong, they're very successful at what they do. Niche market, but even for them, they have 200 million API log files per month to process, right? 200 million. Wow. And like no SOC team wants to wade through 200 million lines. 
so you know a best practice around this to your point is you want to filter out that noise actually a really good practice for SOC teams is when you think about how are you filtering out that noise also bring in to you know context and kind of pre-processing and enrichment of those logs so mm -hmm. it's one thing to get a log file that says like hey this looks malicious right you know you should go inspect that that's typically what a SOC team gets is they get you know some flag that there's something wrong with a particular incident or or a call API call or what have you but if you can get that same you know piece of law of raw data enriched with okay these are the possible you know the top 5 possible suspected attack vectors this is the API that it's associated with we know that it came from this geolocation this was the token that was used so you know some you know this person might have a compromised account or a compromised set of credentials all of that kind of data package that you can bring together and present to the SOC team makes their job so much easier not always easy to be sure but you know most SOC teams that I've spoken to they they would kill for that level of visibility and contextual awareness okay and final question for you here just switching gears there's still a lot of layoffs happening in the tech industry right and artificial intelligence is here so there's some rumblings around more efficiencies with ai and individuals leveraging it in order to be more efficient with their jobs especially yeah. from a mar marketing perspective content videos all those things but maybe a piece of advice for someone that maybe possibly laid off right now in the tech yep. industry yep. or even someone that's a little unhappy within their current position. They, they haven't received a, a raise in a couple of years and yeah. may, may only get like a 1% merit increase because we know inflation is super high and they're talking about stagflation. We have an election. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just so much going on with the economy besides NVIDIA just killing it right now with yeah, the yeah. whole GPUs and all that. The whole stock market is just killing it right now. But yep. there are some concerns around the economy and Pretty the sure. job industry is one. What what advice would you give to someone in that situation? I mean, look, the thing that I think we we face this question as well because you know customers mm -hmm. come to us not from the standpoint of our individual people or our individual jobs or whatever, but they're like, hey, you guys do this stuff with APIs, etc. Why can't I just do that with API with AI? You know, why do I actually need to pay you to help protect my APIs? Why can't I just use an AI to do that? And the thing that we tell them is like, look, what you're getting from us, and this is kind of leading to my advice to job seekers, is you're getting the human understanding of the domain space coupled with the AI's ability to process large volumes of data, summarize it, catalog it, what have you. You know, all the things that we're doing. The point is it's humans plus AI that mm -hmm. makes something more valuable. So if you're a job seeker right now, and especially in the tech industry, I, I'm afraid to say I don't have a lot of advice for people outside the tech industry. You know, my expertise isn't, isn't that uh, great outside yeah. of the tech space. But if you're a job seeker right now, whether you're in IT operations, security, development, even marketing, content creation, what have you, if you could understand a way where you have expertise in using AI to make yourself more efficient or more effective, right? You don't actually need to think about the AI threatening your job. You think about how that AI actually makes you better at your job and mm -hmm. you can bring that skill set to an organization. Most organizations that I talk to right now are just getting started with AI. They're still actually looking for where and how they're going to use it to greatest effect. And right. if you bring that set of expertise into an organization or you bring that to a job candidacy where you're the candidate who stands out because you understand going in day one how you're going to use AI to make the job more efficient, I think that's a huge advantage. And there's any number of resources out there for people looking to get educated about this. Getting accounts on a lot of these services, is there, there are free tiers on many of them or there are mm -hmm. small amounts of money to get started, get yourself trained up. That would be my number one piece of advice. Don't fight it. Don't run away from it. Don't hide from it. Embrace it and figure out how you can use it to make yourself better at your job. Awesome. So you, you have a bit of advice there and you've also heard some best practices and, and ways and insights that you can 
protect and lock down your APIs and, and also some some hypothetical use cases and some some things that you can really take away from this episode. So I, I do want to give you an opportunity to just put a plug in. How, how can someone maybe access or is, is there a trial version of yep. your software? Yeah, absolutely. There's both a trial version of our software. There's also a free tier that we offer for organizations who are looking to kind of kick the tires, get started. Maybe you're a small team, maybe you're a small team within a larger organization. Uh, It'll protect up to five APIs, up to a million API log files analyzed per month. That's just at firetail.app. For anybody looking to learn more about the API security space and the problem, I would encourage you just firetail.io check our data breach tracker or look for the 2024 state of API security report that we put out there. Both are free and mm. that's that's probably the best place to kind of get started learning about it. Is that gated? I do think you have to put in an email address, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to ask that question because uh, sometimes people are a little weird about putting their information in. Oh, just one more one more person to have my email address, but it's, it kind of goes with the with the nature of the beast nowadays. Look, it does, and I will say we don't block one-time email addresses from downloading the report. We do block them from using the free trial. Gotcha. Jeremy, I appreciate you being here. And before I let everyone else go as well, be sure to check out the Backup and Recovery Professionals LinkedIn group. And we have over 26,000 professional cybersecurity, storage, compliance, data protection, even blockchain, right? We, we have similar conversations to the ones we're having here. So go check that group out. And uh, also check out our YouTube channel as well that we recently launched a few months ago. So please go subscribe, share as well. We would definitely appreciate your, your support there. So Jeremy, once again, thank you for being a guest on Data Protection Gumbo. Demetrius, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.